Yo, what's up? Welcome inside the Open the Line. Corey and Benny here with you on a Tuesday morning. Red eyes, you know what I'm saying? Another NBA classic last night. Benny, I don't even know where to start with what we saw last night. A lot to unpack in that basketball game. Yeah, I mean, well, let's start. Let's start at the with the easy thing, right? I mean, big win for the Warriors. So now we're going back to Oracle for Game Six. The it's final gonna, game in Oracle Arena. <laughs> yeah, the last game in Oracle. So I mean, you know, you, you're gonna have a lot of emotions. I mean, I think it's gonna be tough for Toronto to go in there and win that game. And I'm gonna stick by what I said yesterday. I said if the Warriors got that win last night, this this series is going seven. So I'm on the Warriors in this next game here. I think they. They get it back to Toronto for a game seven. And honestly, the way the series has been going, Corey, I'm all for it. No doubt. I'm definitely all for it, too. I can listen. It's like we still got a couple days before we get to that basketball game. What I will tell you about that game is bet the Warriors in the first quarter. The Warriors will, will cover the, the, that, that building is going to be jumping. That place is going to be electric, Benny. But we got plenty of time before we get to talk about that and break down that. Let's, let's kind of start from the back and work our way to the middle and then take it back to the back again. Um, okay. <laughs> talk about, I know it's a lot, but we got to go to the back, then we'll go to the middle, and then we'll circle all the way back to the end. Nick Nurse absolutely bailed the Golden State Warriors out last night, Benny. I didn't know if I didn't get to see it when him answer the question in the press conference, but they go on that run, that, that, that Kawhi Leonard run, the Warriors are wounded. They're wounded. They're beaten down. The roof's about to blow off that building. We're about, they're about to corner the champion. And Nick Nurse calls a timeout. Draymond Green said on ESPN after the game, when he called that timeout, we were able to regroup. Yeah. I, they made a couple coaching slash playing mistakes down the end of the game, too. They had a five-point lead with, like, two minutes left, and they decided to start sitting on the ball. They did it two possessions in a row and ended up with, like, a Kawhi Leonard a Kawhi Leonard 25-foot shot. And then Kyle Lowry had a possession where I don't even think they got a shot off with under two minutes left. Basically, what happened towards the end of that game is they played not to lose instead of playing to win. Yeah. When, and when you play not to lose, a lot of the times you wind up losing because you stop scoring, you open it up, you give the other team a chance. And listen – the Golden State Warriors are champions. Exactly. You know, like you, Benny, they know how they know how to win these games. Exactly. Like when you have your foot on their throat, you need to step down, squeeze, and put them out of their misery. Because if you let them breathe, they're gonna they're gonna come back. They're gonna they're gonna make something happen. And they wound up knocking down like three big three pointers in the last couple minutes of that game. It gave them the lead, a lead that they never uh, you know they never gave up. Toronto's last possession was a, was a bad possession, too. I mean, you knew what was going to happen, right? Like, they doubled Kawhi. They made him give it up. They swung it around. But, I mean, it was not a good shot. Like, you never had the feeling. When the Warriors are down two points with the ball, you're like, oh, my God, someone's going to hit a shot and they're going to win this game. When Toronto was down two points with the ball, as soon as Kawhi Leonard gave it up, I you knew like, yeah, you're like, nobody was making that shot. I knew the game was over. I knew we were going back to Golden State. No, what's tough was what you saw was the Warriors, the, the, you know, with so much going on with that team right now, I hate to say it like this, but those core guys, that core group, Draymond Green with that phenomenal pass to Klay Thompson, that was an excellent pass. As soon as Draymond Green got that basketball, he swung it to Klay Thompson. Ka- Kawhi Leonard comes, the pump fake by Klay, runs past him. That was the game. That was the game winner right there. You had the other three by Steph Curry after that timeout, that Nick Nurse call. It's definitely another corner three in that, in that basketball game. Also, Draymond Green with some big rebounds, great defense tip in that basketball that Kyle Lowry shot late in the game. And, and, and you know what? Th- there you have it. That's, that's what champions do. Go on the road in a hostile environment, win a big game five, and now we send this thing back to Oracle Arena for what should be an epic game six on Thursday night, Benny. So the Warriors get that done, but obviously the big story to come out of last night, Kevin Durant in the second quarter of the game, Tears his Achilles tendon. Um, it looked it looked bad right from the jump. He immediately called for the trainers to come over. Uh, say what you want to say about the fans or whatever. I don't know. Maybe they were a little excited for the most part. They did show some class afterwards. But um, you know, I tell you what. I hate this as a Nick as a Nick guy. You hate to to bring it to this, but a month ago it was Zion Williamson, Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving. <laughs> and now it's just like. 
Now, now it's R.J. Barrett, Raul Beto, and you know. Kimball Walker in. Who's somebody, please? You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I, I, the Kevin Durant situation, though, well, you, that's that's terrible to see that. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is. I really hope all the people who were complaining and saying that KD is soft and he should be playing through this and and all that stuff understand now why why he wasn't right. Like, I mean, this is what I said yesterday. You only get so many chances to play in the NBA championship and the NBA finals throughout your career, even if you're a great player, right? So, I mean, obviously the guy wanted to play. The guy wanted to be out there. But there are just certain times when you're hurt and there are limitations on what you can do where it really doesn't make a lot of sense. He is in his free agent year right now, and he went out there and played, risking, you know, injury and, and money and all that stuff, you know, by going out there and doing it. So I don't want to hear any more of this, oh, KD's soft, KD, you know, doesn't care, he's checked out or whatever. Because the guy who was checked out would have just basically said, no, I'm not playing, I'll wait till my free agent year, good luck, boys, I'll be here to root you on. So that's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, though, is dude, he shouldn't have been playing. I mean, you saw it, and, you know, even before the injury happened, I tweeted out, there was a play at the top of the key where Pascal Siakam got all up on him. And he did, you know, that normal, he went right, he went through his legs. A healthy KD goes through his legs and blows by Pascal Siakam for a dunk or, you know, a nice wide open mid-range jumper and like the foul line. He was not that guy last night. Like, he was definitely not 100%. Still managed to drop 11 or 12 points in the, in the 10, 12 minutes that he played anyway. But really, he should not have been out there on the floor last night. Now, if him being out there was the thing that gave them that boost, they did have a good first quarter lead because of it, and everybody was all hyped up. You know, they were able to hold on and win the game. If that's the thing that got them through the game, then fine, he did his job. If they go back to Oracle and Oracle closing in the next game is the thing that gets them through that game, you know, fine. Then, then you know, him playing wasn't a horrible decision. But, you know, this is obviously going to be something that is going to linger for him. You know, like you said, the Knicks looking at Kevin Durant right now, there's a chance that Durant's not 100% at the beginning of the season now. There's a chance that Kevin Durant could have some lingering injuries that comes along with this. You know, it's just – it's a horrible situation all around. There's really nothing good that came of it. Yeah, you're right, Benny. Nothing good comes of this. You, you kind of look at it, realistic timetable for Kevin Durant. Listen, first of all, Kevin Durant is still the big chip on the free agent market. Oh, without a doubt. You know what I'm saying? The Knicks were still super max. The man's leg could have came off at half court. The, the Knicks was the Knicks were still super max. But my thing is this: you put that kind of heart and determination, and 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 you put it all on the line for that team last night. I don't see him leaving that team. You know what I'm saying? You saw how emotional the players were after the game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, you got you just got to feel you got. You, I, I really think Kevin Durant is, is locked in, and he's a Golden State Warrior. Um, I, that's that's how I really feel about it. Interesting to see. Listen, July first to be here before you know it. So it's going to be, um, you know, we'll see how these things get to shake out. And you know, he he, he laid it all out there. People, the fans last night in Toronto. I'm not I'm not going to kill them because I did see some videos where they started cheering, uh, chanting KD's name. They gave him a standing ovation. You know what I'm saying? He even uh he even acknowledged them afterwards. You know, Kevin Durant grew up a Toronto Raptors fan, uh, rooting for Vince Carter. Yeah, he was a Vince, he okay. was for the Raptors for his team growing up because he liked Vince Carter. Um, so that was good to see him right there. There were, you know, a couple of idiot fans. One dude was the guy that was waving goodbye. They did come and escort him out the game. What do you think about the reaction in Toronto last night when KD went down? Yeah, I mean, you never want to see that. You know, like when a guy gets hurt. I, I mean, you're a Cowboys fan, so you probably remember when Michael Irving – yeah, I was going to say, Michael Irving was the last time I remember a, a big situation like that where a big-time player got an injury. They were chanting kill more Cowboys when Michael Irving was down. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, it, it's never a good look for a town or a city when something like that happens. I will say this, though. I give a lot of, a lot of credit to the players. You know, Kyle Lowry was one of the guys over there being like, yo, we don't – you know. Yeah. He basically pulled a Black Panther last night. He's like, we don't, we don't do that here, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's not how we roll up here in Toronto. So, I mean, it is what it is, you know? I mean, as a fan, you're going to be sitting there. Like, listen, if I'm a Raptors fan, you know, again, the cheering for him getting injured is probably a douchey thing to do. But you got to be honest, if you're a Raptors fan, you, you were pretty happy to see him go down. I mean, it's a lot easier to beat the Golden State Warriors without Kevin Durant than it is to beat him with them. So. They, they would have, the Warriors would have blew If Kevin Durant finishes that game, the Warriors would have blew him out last night. 
and then that Kevin Durant to win the MVP bet <laughs> has a lot more steam. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that five dollars that I put on that is, uh, you know, it was worth it though. Hey, Benny, it was worth it. <laughs> Listen, you know what the funny thing was, Corey? That bet went down to fourteen to one yesterday before the game. Stop playing. That's how many people did the same thing that we were talking about. That's how many people were banging it. it, it they dropped that all the way down to fourteen to one from. Like, it was thirty three hundred. I, I was gonna say it was like at one point it was like twenty five. It was like two hundred fifty to one, and it dropped all the way down to fourteen to one at the end of the um at tip off last night. Fourteen to one was all you were getting on it. Wow, that's a, that's that's amazing right there. Game um, then after the game, the Warriors general manager Bob Myers. That was one of let me, let me before I get to Myers. Let me start with Steve Kerr. Good. Ask Steve Kerr about regretting playing. Kevin Durant. I'm, I love Steve Kerr. I'm a big Steve mm-hmm. Kerr fan. A lot of people that watch and analyze and look at the film and the tape of basketball will say that Steve Kerr's not a good coach. He has the best horses on the track. I just, I'm a Steve Kerr guy, you know what I'm saying? Right. And I think Steve Kerr has been excellent through this run. I think Steve Kerr can run for public office one day. I'm a big Steve Kerr guy. When he was asked last night about regretting playing Kevin Durant, his reply, Benny, was, I have to let Bob handle that one. And I was like, no, 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 no. Five years, champions, this and that. You know what I'm saying? Up there, press conference, talking. When that question is asked, you cannot pass that question off. You're the head coach of this basketball team. You have to have some kind of accountability for it. I didn't like that from Steve Kerr. Now, after the game, Rachel Nichols did catch up with him. And Rachel Nichols said that all Kerr kept saying was, the doctors told us he couldn't re-injure it. The doctors told us – when he said the doctors told us he couldn't get more hurt, the doctors told us he couldn't get more hurt. I didn't like that response by, 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 by Steve Kerr last night. You know what I'm saying, uh, Benny? That was not a good look in my opinion. I, I will agree with you that he should have answered the question, but I'm also going to agree with Steve Kerr. Like, listen, I don't have a medical degree. Yeah. You don't have a medical degree. If somebody hires you to coach a team – you're going to defer to the medical people on whether or not a guy is healthy enough to play. Because you know as a coach, you want Kevin Durant on the court. You know as a player, Kevin Durant wants to be on the court. The people who are supposed to be the ones who are the voice of reason are the medical people there because they're the ones who know how bad that injury is. You know, they're the ones who should be saying to you, listen, you know, there's a 90% chance that this guy's going to walk off the court with some kind of injury because of the injury that he has here, whether it's re-injuring that or compens- overcompensating, which is kind of what they were talking about last night, is that, you know, overcompensating for the one injury is very likely what caused the injury that he wound up having or, or whatever, whether it's the ankle or, or the Achilles. He's supposed to be getting an MRI today. They came out last night and said that – they came out last night, Bob Myers came out last night in this weird press conference where it, it appeared he was crying – I don't know about all that either. I, not, that was, not, he didn't, I didn't see one tear, Benny. Listen, I have a four-year-old, right? And when I tell him it's time to go to bed or it's time to go in the shower or it's time to eat your broccoli or something, he gives me that same face. It's not real tears. So it's, you know, yeah. that, that's my whole thing there, which is, which is what makes it weird. Because, again, when my four-year-old does it, he's four. I'm like, okay, when the GM, you know, 40-year-old guy who's the GM of a – you know, NBA basketball team does it. You're like, uh, hey, buddy, like, you know, what's going on here? I mean, listen, here's the way I'm going to look at it. If the medical staff said that KD was good to go, I would have played him too if I was Steve Kerr. Okay. I don't disagree with that part of it. The part of it I disagree with is why aren't you just being honest? You know what I mean? Like when they, they asked you a direct question, you should have said, listen, you know, we talked to the medical people. The medical people said he was good to go. I talked to KD. KD said he was good to go. We put him out there. You know, we all saw the, the video of him leading up to this game, of him doing his post moves and working out and doing all that stuff. You know, you are got your backs to the wall, three to one. Yes, he's one of the best players, if not the best player in the world. We wanted him out there on the floor. If he was able to go and he wanted to go, we wanted him out there on the floor. Is it a horrible thing what happened, that we saw him go down, that he wasn't able to finish the game? Yes. But in the same situation, again, given the same – set of you know parameters of his health and the way he felt and him playing I would have played him again that's the answer that I would have given as a coach because that's the truth you know if he came back in game seven and had the same medical clearances and he looked good and all that stuff 
you're not going to be like, you know what, KD, just sit this one out. We'll try to win it without you. You're going to put him out there on the floor because he's a competitor. You're a competitor. You want to win, and you want to go out with, you know, guns blazing and, and knowing that you did everything you could. Again, no problem with what they did. My bigger problem is why didn't you just say that? Like, I don't understand why you're trying to, you know, trying to avoid that question. Yeah, and, the, yeah, and, and you're right. So it, it's tough in, in that spot. Obviously, the team teammates were, were very shaken up. Steph Curry last night, very emotional. Um, they they, they uh, asked um, Boogie Cousins about all the people – that the past couple of years that have been calling Kevin Durant salt for goal, uh, for joining the Golden State Warriors, Boogie said on live television, "Fuck those people." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You gotta love Boogie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like even Clay Thompson. You know, they asked Clay Thompson last night, and one of the things he was saying in his interview was like, "Listen, everybody who's saying that we're better off without Kevin Durant, like he, Clay Thompson called him the best player in the world. He, he said he is the best player in the world." He's like, obviously, we're not better off without him. He's like, that's just absolute nonsense. So, you know, the players respect the hell out of him. You know, people who know basketball understand how good this guy is and respect the hell out of him. Listen, I think Kevin Durant did what you would want your superstar to do in that situation. He was hurt. He probably shouldn't have been out there. But he did everything he could to try to get back to help his team win. And he wound up re-injuring himself. So, you can call him soft if you want to call him soft. But – there's a lot. The soft thing to do would have been to just sit it out and wait till free agency. So, you know, I'm not somebody who's going to sit here and call Kevin Durant soft. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Let me get this view back correct. Um, I agree with you 100 on that one, Benny. You know what I mean? Um, how come I can't get this view right? All right, let's go over here. <laughs> and the view is all over the place. <laughs> I don't know. This is random. You know what I'm saying for the time being. All right, so this is what we got, right? I agree with everything you're saying um, on this. But, Benny, the, the organization's job is to protect the player from himself. He shouldn't have been – the, the, the organization – I wouldn't go as far as to say this is medical malpractice, but you have to protect the player from himself in that situation. You have to tell him, now nah, you can't play. You have to tell him that. I, I don't know. I mean, again, to me, if I'm a player, you know, listen, I never played basketball at the NBA level. I never played at that high level. But, yeah. you know – I played literally basketball throughout my entire life. And there were times when, you know, my ankle was hurting like hell. And I went to the trainer and said, yo, just wrap this thing so tight that I can't feel it. Yeah. I went out there and played. If you're a competitor, that's what you want to do. You want to be out there competing. You want to be out there on the floor. You want to be out there, especially when you're a, a major part of your team. Like you want to go out there and help your team win. So, you know, if this was like game 45 of the regular season and they threw him out there, I would, I would be 100% on board with what you're saying. It's like, yo, you're not doing the right thing for the player. In game five, with your backs to the wall of the NBA finals, I, I mean, literally, you know, we grew up in an era, Corey, where guys were tough, quote, unquote, right? Do you think that Bill Lambeer or Isaiah Thomas or Michael Jordan would have sat out? You're right. Isaiah Thomas, I mean, famously – was nowhere ready to play in that finals against the Lakers. He should have. He was a guy that should not have been playing. And you're right. He went out there. Michael Jordan, the flu game. The flu game is something a little bit different. You can't really, you know, that's having the flu is not really hurting yourself. But Kevin Durant put a lot on the line last night. And you know what? Um, you know he he um, you know, next time we'll see Kevin Durant will likely be next season in the playoffs. You know what I mean? So about to miss a full year of basketball for Kevin Durant. So like I said, still the still the top free agent on the market. But the NBA has just really – the NBA really changed last night. You know, July 1st really became a difficult day for a lot of people because now you have a lot of people that's jockeying. The Nets seem like they are all of a sudden in a very good spot with Kyrie Irving, you know what I mean? The Knicks, now they look like they're in a spot where they got to reevaluate and see what they do. I think the Golden State Warriors are looking at this Kevin Durant thing and saying, you know what, we, we want you back, you know what I mean? We're super max you. We don't care if you don't play next year. So everything changed with one player's injury. Now, a couple things here. A couple things here. First off, I, I don't really think the Kyrie Irving thing's a surprise. I mean, I said to you, like, he grew, up, he grew up a Nets fan. You know, playing for the Brooklyn Nets, even though it's not the New Jersey Nets anymore, you know, I, I told you that was something that could happen. Yep. The KD thing to the Knicks, though, is this really that bad of a, a situation? Because look at it this way, right? 
you get KD, maybe he doesn't play for most, if not all, of next season. So that means you suck again, right? Yeah. But now you also have R.J. Barrett or whoever else they decided. I'm just assuming it's R.J. Barrett right now. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. They're going to have a draft pick. Right, right quick, man. I hate to cut you off right quick, but R.J. Barrett did visit Madison Square Garden yesterday. R.J. Mm-hmm. Barrett said he will not be visiting any other uh, team. I saw that. Yeah. He's like, he's like, I want to be a New York Nick. Go ahead. Yeah. But – Think about it now. So you, you had R.J. Barrett next year. You're probably still going to suck, right? So you end up with another high pick the next season. Now you have a healthy Kevin Durant back. Maybe you have some extra free agent money from some other guys that you let walk away. You get another year for a bunch of those young guys that were playing there. And now you have R.J. Barrett, another superstar who they can go get this summer or next summer. And you can also have another top draft pick next year if these things don't work out. You know what I'm saying? So – I actually don't think it's the worst thing in the world. It sucks for Knicks fans, but if you believe in the whole trust the process thing, you know, this is basically oh, uh, like this is this is this is Joel Embiid sitting out his first year or two. You know what I mean? You have optimism now if you're a New York Knicks fan. You know what I'm saying? If the Kevin Durant thing still does happen, you can be optimistic about where about where the franchise goes in the future. As far as Kimba Walker, I hate to say it, knock on wood like this, he's a big winner last night. You know what I'm saying? Because now I'm quite sure the Knicks are like, okay, Kimber Walker is firmly on their radar. He can become a super max guy now uh, with, with, with this situation going down right here and him and him getting that all-NBA team spot. So the free agency will start off in a couple of weeks, and I think we'll, it, it'll, be, it'll be fun and it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. Uh, right now, MVP, Kawhi Leonard is still minus 322. Steph Curry is 240. Draymond Green is 4,000. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Steph yesterday was 450. Now he's 240. So they basically cut that in half, kind of. Um, I mean, listen, if Toronto wins, the MVP is Kawhi. I don't even think yeah, there's a question exactly. about that. Here's a sneaky one, though, that you can look at. What is Clay Thompson right now? That's interesting that you mentioned that. Clay Thompson is plus 6,300. That's worth, that's, worth, that's worth a little bit of a bet right there, Corey. Okay. That's worth a little bit of a bet because Clay's been playing really well here. You know, there's no Kevin Durant going forward now, so I could see Clay having a big scoring game, one if not both of the next two games, and kind of stealing the thunder from, uh, you know, from Steph. Because I don't think – does Steph have a finals MVP? No. Maybe one, right? He's been terrible in the finals of the matter. That's what I'm saying. So, I, I mean, this is not – you know, it's not, like, it's not like this is something that's a lock. Like, to me, I can't see them giving – if Toronto wins, I can't see anybody else getting the MVP other than Kawhi. No, no, Kawhi, Kawhi is definitely the MVP if Toronto wins. People are saying, you know, it's going to be a tough environment in Oracle for game six. The Toronto Raptors are a very tough team, bro. The Toronto Raptors are a very tough team. They have the heart of a champion. You know what I'm saying? They yep. fight. Kawhi Leonard is very good. He's an excellent basketball player. Nick Nurse, outside of that timeout last night, has done a great job coaching this team. So it's going to continue to be a dogfight. The NBA is once again – Giving us a very good product this um uh this season, Benny. So um, it's been a great. This has been a great finals. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. This has been a great finals. Like I hate the fact that they stretch this thing out for three weeks. Like there's really no need for a three day break now between this game and the next game. There really isn't. But at the same point in time, this has been a very good series. No, it's been it's been excellent. Um, that series now yesterday it was plus four forty for the Golden State Warriors. Now the Golden State Warriors are plus two fifteen to win the series. What is um? What are the Raptors? The Raptors are minus two seventy. Nice, because I mean I'm still sitting on that. Remember when I had that um that promotion? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, I had an eighty five dollar bet that pays like five twenty on the Warriors because it was plus five forty or something like that. And then I put like a fifty dollar bet before the series started on the Raptors. So no matter who wins, I'm gonna make money. If the Raptors win, I make like 20 bucks. If Golden State wins, I make like 300, 400. So I didn't want to do it before last night because the Raptors were like minus 400 last night to win the series. I'm, I'm trying to see if I should pull the trigger now or wait till game seven on like hedging a little bit of that in the middle. So I won't have as much upside if the, if the Warriors go into Toronto and win game seven or, or you know, whatever. But I want to get more out of – the Raptors winning, but I, I, I think I'm going to hold off on game six. And if the Warriors get to game seven, I think on game seven, you know, again, I'm 300 to 20 to the good on both of them. So maybe put like 150 on the Raptors and hope I can get it around even money and kind of yeah, make- that Raptors numbers going to drop. That Raptors number should drop again Friday morning. 
That's the thing about it. That's right? what I'm saying. I don't want to. I didn't want to jump on it at minus 400 before game five no. because I basically would have been betting 400 to win an extra hundred, yeah. and I would have been giving up all my upside with the Warriors. If I can get this to a game seven, though, Toronto's probably going to be favored, but not by a lot. Like it's going to be like minus one twenty. It's going to be a pick, Benny. It's going to be a pick, and I think they, well, if it's a pick, I'll take it. That's fine. I think, I think both teams come in at minus one ten. I really think Game Seven will be a pick. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's the Golden State Warriors in a one yeah, that, scenario. That would be fine with me. Like I said, this way I could kind of hedge it a little bit, and no matter what happens, walk away with you know a two hundred dollar profit or so, no matter which way it goes. Like that's you're, really you're, you're, in, you're in a very good spot right now, um, Benny. So they, so there goes that right there. Time to start planning these situations as we look ahead, you know, for the Major League Baseball season also, you know, because, um, you know, you want to be able to, when you get to October, have some, um, you know, have a chance to make some money no matter what happens. I think that's definitely a smart way to go. And um, when you look at some MLB futures, the Minnesota Twins right now are plus 750 to win the World Series. I think that's the team that's going to be the big team that's going to get, people are going to be hedging on. I mean, people are going to be putting some, some nice future money down on. See, for me, when I'm looking to put future money down at this point of a year, I'm not looking for the team. Yeah, I'm not looking for the team in first place. I'm not looking for the team that's most likely to be there. I'm looking for somebody who underperformed that I can get at much bigger odds now than I should have got the, that I could have got them at at the beginning of the season and that I should be getting them at towards the end of the year. Like to me, Corey, one to look at would be like the Boston Red Sox right now. Because the Red Sox are actually in third in the East behind the Yankees and the Rays. And at the beginning of the season, this is a team a lot of people were picking to win the World Series. You know, at the beginning of the season, they were maybe like a 400 or so to win it all. Right now, you're probably getting, I don't know, what, seven, 800 on them, if not more? Plus 1,900. There you go. You're getting them at four to five times what you were getting them at at the beginning of the year. So if you want to take a chance on a team that can make a turnaround, that's a team that we've seen do it before. And it's not even, it, it may not even be with the guys they have, right? Like, this is a team that'll go out and, mortgage the farm to bring in three more arms if that's what they think they need. This or to go get another stud bat if that's what they think they need. Uh, Brian Cashman was on with Mike Francesa yesterday, and Brian Cashman said he, he foresees this being a buyer's market this year. You know what I'm saying? Especially in the American League, you know what I mean? With uh, America, the American League, you know who the teams are. You know what I mean? So you already have it figured out who those teams are. So he sees a buyer's market in the American League this year. So um, that's just, you know, a little bit of a way to play the future game, obviously, the NFL and college football coming up. Also, Benny, before we get to some baseball, any soccer that we can discuss for today? Anything? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple oh, the girls. Games, the, the United States girls play today. Uh, yeah. USA and Thailand. Well, I, I see something funny. Hold on. Look yeah. at that. <laughs> what do you think for I mean, a Women's World Cup? Yeah, the U, I mean, the U.S. is a minus 10,000 favorite here. I'm today. looking at so this. Like, yeah, basically, you, you bet $100 to win a dollar. That's crazy. Um, I think the spread on this game, which I don't even know if they have it listed on some of the sites, but the spread on this game on the European books is like five or five and a half goals. Like that, that's ridiculous. You know, this is basically like a, this would be like a professional basketball team playing a high school basketball team. It is kind of the equivalent of what's going on here. That's really the only one from the women's world cup I'm looking at. Um, there's a couple things in the Euro, the, the Euros um, that you can look at. Like, France is another one. France is, like, a minus 10,000 favorite. Germany is a minus 5,000 favorite. You know, these, these are both teams that should win really, really easy. Here are some of the ones that are, like, decent, decent odds, like, decent money, though. Um, I like Italy at minus 295 against Bosnia and Herzegovina today. Okay. You know, Italy is not the soccer power that they have been. I just want people to understand that. Like, this is, this is not a lock. This is kind of a weaker Italian team. Um, and me being Italian, I know this because I actually watch a lot of Italian soccer. Uh -huh. They're not as good as they've been in years past, but they still should be good enough to beat Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, at minus 295, that's not a bad one. Russia is minus 480 against Cyprus. That should be a bloodbath. Um, you know, Cyprus, Russia, Russia is not a bad soccer country. Um, and again, it's such a big country. They have a lot of players. Cyprus, they just don't have any shot there. The game I like the most, Belgium is going to beat Scotland. Belgium is about minus 650. Here's my, here's my bet for today for, uh, for soccer, though. Um, Aiden Hazard is the best player on Belgium. Uh -huh. He's uh, played for Chelsea. He was a guy that had a bunch of goals in, the, in the, um, you know, that Chelsea game at the end of the year that we were talking about. Plus 310 for him to score the first goal is something I'd be willing to take a little bit of a chance on. Again, these first goal things are like the home run or the first touchdown things yeah. like – 
this is not something you should be putting your whole bankroll on. But, you know, at plus 310, he's the guy that's likely to take their free kicks. He's the guy that will likely take penalty kicks. And he can also score just in the run of play as well. So I like Hazard to be the guy that scores the first goal there. So you could take Hazard at, like, plus 310 and link him with, like, you know, Belgium to win or, like, Russia or Italy. You know, if you want to throw the U.S. women on there or whatever, like, Again, if the U.S. woman lost today, Corey, it would be like the biggest upset in history. It would, it would, it would, it would, be, it would be, it would be bigger than than uh, Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson. It, it would make Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson look like a fair, you know, even money fight. Like that's <laughs> that's how bad the mismatch is here today. So, and the thing is, that's tough. Like, I was trying to find some value here. Like, oh, maybe we'll do first goal or something like that. But Thailand's so bad, everybody could score against them. I, you and I could go out there and score against them. So. I've been working on my um I, I haven't played I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and I haven't played <laughs> soccer in ten years. I mean, I'm not that bad. Oh man. Got a big slate today. Obviously, uh doesn't not not a good for me. I have to go over to the Bronx this afternoon. And with the with the Yankees having a one o'clock start and a seven o'clock start, that means that there's gonna be traffic in the South Bronx <laughs> the entire day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Vinny? <laughs> It is what it, the one good thing is you may get a lot of people taking the subway in or something like that, you know, because it is the subway series. So, you, you know, you never know. Maybe a lot of people coming over from Queens, so you might not hit that track. I can't see a big, a big contingent of Mets fans coming into the city today, coming into the Bronx this afternoon to see a Mets team that is uh, not up to par. Uh, the, the subway series has lost some flair to me. Well, it loses – again, any series or any rivalry loses its, its flair when both teams aren't good or both teams aren't bad. Yep. You know, when one team's been good lately and the other team's been bad, it's not much of a rivalry. You know, like, people keep saying that the Patriots and the Jets are rivals. You can't be a rival if you never win. So, yeah. like, to me, that's not really a rivalry at this point in time. Maybe at one point it was, but the last 10 or 15 years it hasn't been. And that's really the kind of the way it is right now. You know, the other thing, too, is, like, the Subway Series to me was when they met in the World Series. Yeah. Like, that was the Subway Series. And I you agree. had – Everybody invested in that. Whether you were a Mets fan or a Yankees fan, whatever side of the fence you were on, everybody was wearing their hats in the city that day. You know, you had guys in full three-piece suits, $1,000 suits, walking around with either a Yankees or a Mets hat on for, you know, that whole month while that playoff run and everything was going. A, a middle-of-the-season meetup between these two teams, it just doesn't have the same juice to it. No doubt. I remember that Subway Series um, you know, very well. And the thing about that is, I remember that I remember that game one was a classic game in that series. Um, it was a big game. I believe it went to extra innings. The Yankees won that game. Game one in that series in extra innings. I actually was coming back from a bar. The city was so lit. Now I'm in, you know, I'm coming back from a bar. I'm in Spanish Harlem. I don't gotta tell you, Spanish Harlem is not. You don't have. There's no Met fans in Spanish Harlem. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I'm talking about. We didn't even have to watch the game. We were standing outside. We knew the Yankees won because we can hear everybody cheering from their house. I was just going to say, I mean, even from your house. Like, even I watched the game from my house, and you could hear all your neighbors. Everybody was involved. Everybody was looking at it. Like I said, everybody that week was walking around with either a dark blue or a light blue hat on. You, you picked your side. You were on one side or the other. Today, you could ask the average person. They probably don't even know that the Mets and the Yankees are playing a doubleheader today. Yep, yeah, there you go right there. That was what well, Derek Jeter was the uh, MVP of that series, that series right there. All right, Benny, so what we got uh, – any, any good baseball for us today? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll give you a couple things that I'm looking at. Um, you know, in game two of the Subway Series, you know, I, I do like the matchup with Paxton against Vargas. You know, game one, Tanaka and Wheeler is kind of close to me. So I'm probably yeah. – I mean, listen, I'm probably going to bet the Yankees both games because I'm a Yankees fan. But my biggest bet of the day or my bigger bet of the day will probably be Paxton in the second one. Um, what else do I got here? I like the over in Toronto, Baltimore. Uh, you got Thornton going up against Means. This kid Means has looked pretty good, but the numbers, the underlying numbers suggest he's been pitching over his head a little bit. Um, ERA way below the XFIP at this point. So you got to figure some regression is coming. I know this isn't two great offenses with Toronto and Baltimore, but it's more a, a play on the fact that it's in a good hitters ballpark in Baltimore. And neither one of these pitchers are all that great. Um, two of my favorite bets in the day. I love the Twins against Leak today. Uh, they're about minus 180. They're a team that I have a lot of exposure to. And then my other favorite bet of the day is actually the San Diego Padres over the San Francisco Giants. If you haven't seen this kid pitch, this kid Chris Paddock from San Diego 
Yeah, he's very good. I mean, sub three ERA right now, whip of 0.89 over a K per inning. I mean, these are like Cy Young Award contender type numbers that this kid is putting up. So I like him against San Francisco, which is an offense that I really think is just – they just don't have anything. It's in a good pitcher's ballpark in San Francisco. I think Paddock is going to pitch a very good game today, and I really like them at minus 165. No doubt about it. So there you go right there. They go some baseball for the day and get down there and lay it down, try to get some dollars, get that bank, uh, get the bank account, get that account rolling once again. So that's what we have uh, going down for tonight. And also you got – um. You know, some more things that you can bet on, obviously, the, the soccer being big today, going along with Major League Baseball. Big piece of chicken, obviously, for myself, it goes to Kevin Durant. Um, just a, a tough, tough, tough day to see him go down like, like that last night in enemy territory. But, um, you know, way to, way to grind it out, way to come back, way to show heart and fight for that team. Put it all on the line for his brothers. Kevin Durant, you get multiple big pieces of chicken. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give my big piece of chicken. It's actually going to be big pieces of chicken, and it's going to the entire Warriors team yesterday yeah. because that was, that was a hell of a win for them. I mean, they came out and they had the lead. They lost the lead in the fourth quarter. They were up 10 or 12 going into the fourth quarter at one point. You know, and then oh, it went down. crazy. That building was jumping, ready to explode, and you're just like – Yep. I mean, he had, Kawhi had 10 straight points. He put them up six with like two and a half minutes left. And the Warriors were just like, okay. Remember the tip-in, the boogie tip-in that would have made it a one-point game? Yeah. No. You saw Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson turned around, slapped Boogie's hand, was like, don't worry about it. It's all good. We got this. Yep. And then he came out and hit a big three. Steph hit a big three. Like, they just – that's a team – again, champions are, are not going to just walk away. You're not just going to – you're not going to win against a champion. You have, to, you have to step on their throat. You have to put them out of their misery. You want that belt. You got to come take it. Toronto last night didn't come take it. And now they're going back to Oracle and very likely are going to be coming back to Toronto and have to beat them again in a game seven. So Father's Day should be very interesting this year. We'll have a Father's Day. We'll have a game seven on Father's Day. And that's always, uh, that's always a good way to end that day, the U.S. Open. And you've got a game seven that night to, uh, to, to, to end the NBA season. Um, and you're, you're correct in what you say, Benny, about, about the Golden State Warriors, you know, it's like my homeboy told me last night. They didn't win all those championships to go down in five games. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They did not yeah. win those championships to go down in five games. They're gonna throw. They're gonna throw their haymakers. You know, I mean, whether or not they connect. Like, listen, the thing that's scary about Golden State is, you know, the old coaching adage: you live by the three, you die by the three. Right? Golden State is never out of a game because of the way they can shoot, but they also have to be careful because you have to shoot well three games in a row now to win. You know what I mean? Like, that's – they did it last night. They hit the shots when they needed to last night. But, again, you live by the three, you die by the three. When those shots aren't going down, this is a team that's easily beatable. You know, they need to keep making shots and keep fighting and keep keeping it on. All right, here we go, Benny. Right quick, before we get out of here today, I, want, I, I found this to be very interesting. Most threes in NBA Finals history. Michael Jordan has 42. Manager Nobley has 42. Kevin Durant has 43. Danny Green has 48. Derek Fisher has 48. Kobe Bryant has 48. Ray Allen has 55. Robert Ory has 56. J.R. Smith, Sweezy, has 58. Mm. Clay Thompson has 77. LeBron James has 86. You know who number one is? This is Steph Curry. You know by a wide margin. 115. Yes. <laughs> I mean, listen, we, we've said it all the time. Like, there are guys – a guy used to hit three threes in a game, and you were like, wow, he shot the lights out. Steph Curry hits three threes in a quarter. Like, yeah. it, it's, it's just it's, – it's, look at all the names that you mentioned. Look at all the names on that list that you mentioned. How many of them are, like, recent guys playing now? I mean, the game has changed. Even from a couple of years ago, like Kobe Bryant, how many finals did Kobe Bryant play in? He only has, what, 50 or something? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? He only has 50-something. So, there you go right there. Um, all right, so there you go. We are out for the day. Make sure everything that you make sure you sub subscribe. Make sure you hit us up. You know what I'm saying? For my main man, Benny M. Corey, the fantasy executive, we are out.